understanding trade-offs is one of the main things economists need to do. So a key concept in studying markets is the rate at which consumers trade off between different goods. So think of the cookie monster. He consumes milk and cookies. So good one is Q1, and it's milk, and good two is cookies. Now think of the bundle A, where there are 10 cups of milk and 100 cookies. And let's suppose this gives him the utility K. Now let's suppose we offer Cookie Monster one more glass of milk in exchange for some number, let's say SA, units of cookies. And we want to do it in a way where Cookie Monster's utility remains at K. So we're not, we're offering him this trade of one more glass of milk in exchange for SA cookies in a way that doesn't make him any worse off or better off. SA is Cookie Monster's rate of substitution at the bundle A. It's the number of cookies he's willing to give up in order to get one more glass of milk. In other words, it's the solution to the equation U of 11 glasses of milk and 100 minus SA cookies is still equal to the utility level K. Now this rate of substitution is going to change at, it's not going to be the same at every possible bundle. That's why we said this is his rate of substitution at the bundle A. So let's say Cookie Monster started at a different bundle. Let's say he started at the bundle B. So he started at the bundle B, and let's say at the bundle B, his utility level was K as well. Now, how is this bundle B different? Well, he's getting 100 glasses of milk, but only 10 cookies. Now, again, we say, hey, Cookie Monster, I'm going to give you one more glass of milk in exchange for SB cookies. How many cookies are you willing to give up that keeps your utility level exactly the same at K? How do we expect SA to compare to SB, or SB to compare to SA? Would we expect them to be the same? Remember, in the first question we asked him, he, he, he was starting from 10 glasses of milk and already had 100 cookies. But now he's got 100 glasses of milk and only has 10 cookies. Most likely, SB is going to be a lot smaller than SA. So as you move down the indifference curve, so if we drew a picture, there are two bundles here and here. So this is B, right? There's 100, only 10, 10 and 100. That's A. So he's willing to give up, at A, he's willing to give up more cookies for an extra glass of milk, but at B, he's willing to give up fewer cookies for an extra glass of milk. So as you move in this direction, we typically expect the rate of substitution to decrease. Now this is not always going to be true, but what it means economically is that consumers prefer balanced bundles. So they, they prefer mixtures of the goods rather than extremes, extreme bundles. So what it really means is that the indifference curves are bowed towards the origin. So again, if I draw this picture, so it's good one and good two, when we draw the indifference curves, they're bowed towards the origin. They're going to be steeper here, flatter here. So what we did so far was look at what happens when there's a discrete change in the number of cookies or number of glasses of milk. What about trades of different sizes? Well, the most useful concept is the rate at which Cookie Monster is willing to trade off between milk and cookies at what's called the margin. So what we mean by that is for very small changes, 
So if we offer Cookie Monster just a teeny tiny extra amount of milk, dq1, so that's where calculus is going to kick in. Remember, calculus tells us about how things respond to very small changes. So if there's a very small change in the quantity of milk q1, dq1, how many cookies dq2 is he willing to give up? That ratio, dq2 over dq1, is what we call the marginal rate of substitution. And what it's actually going to tell us is the slope of the indifference curve. So if we draw a tangent to the indifference curve, what's the slope of that line? This is going to be one of the key concepts you're going to learn in this course. So I strongly recommend that you spend a little extra time making sure you understand it. Okay, so geometrically, what is the marginal rate of substitution? Well, so like I said, it's the slope of the indifference curve at any given point. So it answers the question, how much of good 2 are you willing to give up for a tiny bit more of good 1? And if the marginal rate of substitution decreases, what that means is that the indifference curve gets flatter as we move towards the right. So as we go in this direction, the slope gets flatter, which means the marginal rate of substitution is decreasing. The next thing we need to do is figure out how to calculate the marginal rate of substitution when we have a utility function. To do that, we're going to use the concept of marginal utility. So marginal utility is the extra utility you get from a tiny bit more of a given good, holding constant everything else. So the marginal utility from good i is, so if i and j are the two goods, the marginal utility from good i is the extra utility you get from a tiny bit more of good i holding fixed the amount of good j. So this is essentially the definition of the partial derivative of the utility function with respect to good i. So we're going to use the following notation. So the marginal utility from good 1, mu1, is the partial derivative of utility with respect to good 1. We're going to use the, sometimes we'll use capital U subscript 1 to represent that. The marginal utility from good 2 is similarly the partial derivative of utility with respect to good 2. So we're going to use u2 to represent that. Notice one important thing here is that it depends on the utility function we're using. If we multiply the utility function by 2, then the derivatives are going to be multiplied by 2. If we uh, take the square root of the utility function, then that's going to change the uh, derivative as well. So the actual utility function we're using is going to make a difference. Remember, if we go back to our discussion of utility functions, there are many utility functions that describe the same preferences. But which utility function you use matters for the marginal utilities. Now, how are you going to use these marginal utilities to calculate the marginal rate of substitution? Let's say we are at some utility level k. So we've got some bundle q1, q2 that gives this consumer the utility level k. Let's think of changing the quantities of good 1 and good 2 by dq1 and dq2 respectively. Just to write down this equation, let's consider these both as increases. Now we want these quote-unquote increases to be such that the change in utility is zero, so the utility is kept constant. We can find another way to express du. du is the total change in the consumer's utility. Now there are two sources to the consumer's change in utility. The first is the change in the quantity of good 1. The second is the change in the quantity of good 2. Now remember the marginal utility of good 1 is the increase in utility per unit increase in the quantity of good 1 that the consumer consumes. Of course, for small changes. However, dq1 is a small change. So if we want the total change in utility due to the change in the consumption of good 1, then it's the per unit change times the amount of change. So it's u1 dq1. Similarly, there's a change in the utility from the consumption of good 2. 
it's U2 DQ2. So the total change in utility is just the sum of those, U1 DQ1 plus U2 DQ2. Now, we've chosen DQ1 and DQ2 such that the total change to utility is zero. So we've got this equation, that U1 DQ1 plus U2 DQ2 equals zero. Well, we can rearrange that. What we're interested in, remember, is the ratio of DQ2 to DQ1. If we solve for that ratio, we have our marginal rate of substitution, and that's negative ratio of the marginal utilities. I should point out here that we said that DQ1 and DQ2 were going to be increases, quote unquote. And that's how we wrote down the equation. And indeed, when we talked about here that the utility was uh, the from the increase in the quantity of good 2, uh, that's indeed how we talked about it. However, we see here that one of the two had to be a negative number because u1 and u2 are both positive numbers because of the uh, more is better principle. So one of these two numbers had to be a negative number. Indeed, if this were a negative number, then the quote unquote increase of a negative amount is technically a decrease. So we give you a little bit more good one and you accept a decrease in good two. And that keeps you on the same indifference curve. So we therefore have that the marginal rate of substitution is the negative ratio of the marginal utilities. So the slope of the tangent to the indifference curve at any point is going to be the negative ratio of the marginal utilities. So diminishing marginal rate of substitution means that the absolute value of this slope is decreasing, which means that the slope is getting, the curve is getting flatter and flatter. Now, it's important to be careful here. Some people define the marginal rate of substitution as just being the, the ratio. So it's important to be careful as to uh, how you're defining it and um, be careful about the signs. In this course, I'm going to use minus u1 over u2 as a marginal rate of substitution. So let's do an example to clarify ideas. Let's calculate the marginal rate of substitution for this Cobb-Douglas utility function. q1 to the a, q2 to the 1 minus a. So first things first, calculate the marginal utility for good 1. It's just a partial derivative of this with respect to q1. So that's just a q1 to the a minus 1 times q2 to the 1 minus a. Step 2, calculate the marginal utility with respect to good 2. So just take the derivative of this thing with respect to q2, and we get 1 minus a times q1 to the a, q2 to the 1 minus a minus 1, which is minus a. Then we just take the ratio of those two. So marginal rate of substitution is the negative ratio of u1 to u2. So we have that as our marginal rate of substitution. It's this guy divided by this guy. So we've got a over 1 minus a. We've got the minus sign in front. And then we've got q1 to the a minus 1, q2 to the 1 minus a, divided by q1 to the a, q2 to the minus a. Well, I can rewrite that as minus a over 1 minus a, q1 to the, it's 1 over q1 to the 1 minus a, because a minus 1 is negative 1 minus a, times 1 over q1 to the a, times q2 to the negative a is just q2, we've got 1 over q2 to the negative a, so that's just q2 to the a times q2 to the 1 minus a. Now, we've got negative a over 1 minus a, 
When we multiply these two together, we just get 1 over q1. When we multiply these two together, we just get q2. And so we have it. That's the marginal rate of substitution. Now, can we verify that this marginal rate of substitution is diminishing? Indeed, we can. Let's plug in a equals a half. So when a equals a half, it simplifies things because the a and the 1 minus a are equal to one another and they cancel out. So the marginal rate of substitution is just the negative q2 over q1. Of course, we see here that the marginal rate of substitution clearly depends on q1 and q2. And so it's going to change as you move along the indifference curve. So at 110 and 101, you get the same utility. So they're on the same indifference curve. But at 110, the marginal rate of substitution is minus 10. But at 101, the marginal rate of substitution is negative 110. Clearly, you have a diminishing marginal rate of substitution. One thing that's important to note, I pointed out earlier that the marginal utility depends on the choice of utility function. However, the marginal rate of substitution doesn't. So it's a real feature only of the actual preferences. So let's say you had two utility functions. So you take u and you take v. And v is just u doubled. They represent the same preferences as we saw earlier. The marginal utility of u and v are not the same. The marginal utility of is, actually this is backwards. The marginal utility v, v1 is 2 times u1. So it's v1 equals 2 times u1. So the marginal utility, if you use, the marginal utility you'll calculate it if you start from utility function u is minus u1 over u2. The marginal utility you'll calculate if you start from the utility function v is minus v1 over v2. But that's just minus 2u1 over 2u2. The 2s are going to cancel out. So you've got minus u1 over u2 again. So it's important to note here that the marginal utilities are not the same for the two utility functions. And that's because marginal utility is measured, just like, in, just like utility, in some fictional units. However, the marginal rate of substitution is not measured in some fictional unit, and it doesn't depend on the specific utility function. It depends only on the shape of the indifference curves. So it actually has a real-world meaning.